was. I, I'm not. I'm not going to make a make a total total um, a total uh, you know plea for accepting younger you know uh, 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 prima facie. But but anyway, Bertolt Brecht uh, basically instructed the uh, the the East German um, uh, communists leave Junger alone when they came mm. in Berlin. So I, I want to just say that he had quite a reputation as someone who could describe through the novel Storm of Steel, French Warfare, which he self-published, by the way. Um, you know, he tried to take out Hitler, 1940. You know, he never really joined up with the National Socialist Movement. With, with He refused to go on Goebbels' radio program many times. So um, unlike Heidegger, he did not somewhat conform to the program, right, so to speak. Junger was a kind of outsider, but never was really a man of the left, if you will, or, uh, you know, in this sense. So it's very important to remember this about him. He lived to be 103 years old, very healthy. Wow. He took a lot of LSD of the early Hoffman LaRoche uh, uh, variety in the 50s. He was part of the early experiments before Leary and others, uh, you know, started in the States. And, um, um, and, uh, and also invented a, a, a particular uh, a type of insect. And there's an award named for him in Germany um, um, uh, for insect, uh, you know, for, for um, discovery of index and entomological. Um, uh, Mological uh, prize is named for him. So, um, you know, really, uh, I think, you know, given what we've done with Stieglers and, and others, um, I think it's important to remember that, um, you know, Junger um, is one of the first to really think and grapple with the problem of nihilism, you know, in our time, you know, and in a way, one essay could be from the origins of European nihilism and how it plays out in many, many forms. And Junger has, you know, three parts we can discuss after you read it, you know, nihilism and chaos, nihilism and evil and nihilism and illness, um, you know, it's three different forces and, and tensions that are operative in the world. Um, that this, this, this nihilism that he talks about is, is really kind of anticipating Nietzsche's history of the world for the next two centuries is the advent, the beginning of nihilism. And this seems to be one of our central pro problems, you know, as we go approach more and more forms of, you know, what Stiegler calls, and I like this term very much, symbolic misery, the mm -hmm. inability of the human subject now to make symbols, not only to make things, as he says, the, the homo faber has been lost, you know, this new proletization of the world, but this inability to make oneself, right? This mm -hmm. inability to, you know, grasp uh, what's going on and build symbolic power and this inability to synthesize in symbolic form. You know, either you're taking it literalist as these idiots on the Supreme Court in the Roe versus Wade thing, you know, where does it say in the constitution, the woman has a right to vote. Mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me, they didn't have the right to vote, much less the right to have an abortion. You know, this kind of idiocy that we're facing is very much symptomatic, in, in my, my opinion, the nihilism as illness, where we, where we really are, and this kind of a, a, a notion. So um, um, anyway, um, you know, 1949, when he wrote this piece, and I'll, I'll go over the readings for the uh, next six probably going to be eight weeks. Uh, but anyway, um, the, the, um, the, uh, when he wrote this was 1949. So remember, this is the rebuilding of Germany, right? Yeah, after decimation, the splitting, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, during the advent of obviously the Truman Doctrine, the Cold War, um, you know, the Marshall Plan, et cetera, et cetera. And Junger has real stakes going forward. And he's really going to study the line, but also attempt that it, it really involves an active crossing. So across the line, for him, Heidegger wanted to sit and study the line. This is an interesting contrast between the two personalities. One who passively, in some ways, passively surrendered, if you will, or gave in to, to thinking, that thinking takes us over, whereas Junger was much more active in this in, in some ways. And, you know, as I said, he became a cult figure. So he's writing this 1949. He's uh, 50, um, 
about uh, 54 years old at the time, about half of his life. You know, as I said, he lived to be 103. And very much, uh, it, um, you know, thinking through the great, um, you know, and, and I think all of you know The Will to Power of Nietzsche. This book was put together by Walter Kaufman. These were fragments left by Nietzsche. Um, I have a good friend who's uh, written on, uh, this is a Nietzsche's political testament, if you will, uh, as a Machiavellian enterprise, right? That Nietzsche wanted to become the Machiavelli of the 20th and 21st centuries and the will to power its fragments were very important. Of course, uh, on the left, and again, this is a bit of a historical reference, the destruction of reason by Lukács really tries to put Nietzsche outside and sees this as again, an irrational text, even though Lukács did not have full 1080 of the propositions that were ordered by Kaufman, he's only reading 400 of them and thought that this really led to a kind of new type of fascism. So it's interesting the way this plays out in terms of this very strong and weak interpretations of Nietzsche that, that are happening. Junger is part again of something that I think we need to think through. It's very active today in many ways, the conservative revolution, you know, uh, you know, and he had great respect for the Bolsheviks too. I mean, I want to say that. And this whole notion of Nietzsche as a figure that looms very large behind this is I think, again, very important to, to remember as we go forward. And the thinker, if you will, of, uh, you know, uh, in many ways, uh, the warfare state, the warrior, the, the aristocratic warrior, the warrior prince, if you will. So as a type and a type to come. And Junger had a notion of the worker, you know, um, the worker uh, um, um, educator and uh, and uh, and uh, a warrior, um, and he and he built a movement around this. And he thought that the uh, the the notion of um, what what Hitler was doing was completely anathema to this. Yeah. So again, well, yeah. So we'll begin with Junger. Let me go through the readings quickly and we can have a discussion and maybe some things you'd like to do, of course. But the, 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 the other reading where I wanna go from there is to the Mill Plateau. So these texts, by the way, are all included on the website and Matt will put them up too uh, on the left form, but they're also on the Institute website. The second part across the line of the Heidegger Junger correspondence and then uh, uh, Mill Plateau or A Thousand Plateaus, this book, which is pretty beat up, the Masumi uh, translation uh, back in the day. This was done in 1980 uh, and then translated after afterwards and never really taken seriously. People enjoyed it, you know, around in a way. It became kind of a, a cult book, but never really studied actively. We're going to read uh, chapter 12, which, you know, they use dates, speaking of time, of the moment of the invention on the plateau. The plateau is 1227. So it's a very creative experimental work, again, with Deleuze and Guattari and, you know, uh, you know, and who knows what kind of drugs were being used then. But, but, you know, anyway, very, very interesting. The War Machine itself, a treatise on nomadology. And, and we're gonna look at, uh, you know, everything uh, in that chapter, particularly how they write it as a Spinoza's document, very much modeled on Spinoza's ethics, built with axioms and then propositions, right? Very interesting how they do this. And then they give many, many examples. So this is about uh, 80 page, 70 pages. We're gonna stress many of the, 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 the main major parts, but I think you're gonna find it very interesting, the distinction they make between royal science and the other science, right? The distinction between the nomadic and the logos, right? This will be very interesting between the nomos and the nomad uh, thinking and the nomad war machine versus the apparatus of the state, you know, which anticipates maybe part of the confrontation between what I consider to be interesting in modern warfare, Clausewitz as a 19th century thinker of war, you know, and coming out of the Napoleonic uh, European tradition and still active in many, you know, war colleges uh, versus that of General Giap or Che Guevara's Foucault mm -hmm. theory 
and we can look at some of this stuff as well, you know, as, as we go forward. So we're gonna, we'll have, hopefully have a, a really good time with that. And it uh, begins with, of course, um, um, uh, the great quote of, uh, uh, on, uh, of uh, Arthur Rambeau, right? Um, and um, um, of about, I am not of your, I'm, I'm not of your race, I'm of an inferior race. And he goes through this, you know, and Rambo being one of the great figures of uh, our, our time in, in the background again. So we're gonna look at, you know, models of science, the comparative and the disparate that they do. One as material form and the other as material forces, you know, which will go on in this, in this uh, piece. And also it's, like I said, a kind of rewriting of on the line in a different way, in a different approach to nihilism. Those of you that did the anti-Oedipus, uh, uh, course, um, we, 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 we can talk about how Nietzsche, you know, rendered the death of God so many times to render it comic and wants us to get on to other things. Well, I think Deleuze and Guattari want to get across the line into a new line, right, of thinking that anticipates a lot. And that, of course, then we'll spend a little bit of time on that, and then we're going to move on to Wars and Capital, this great uh, collaboration between Eric Aliez and, uh, you know, I, I kind of divided it into four weeks. We'll probably have to take more to do it, but it's very interesting. Uh, you know, the, the treatment of women, uh, Sylvia Federici has mentioned, you know, Caliban and the Witch, uh, of which I guess a lot of us know about. Uh, we're going to, we'll speak to that. We're going to be looking at uh, the originary accumulation, a kind of new reading of Marx and Capital. Uh, so Shane, if you take uh, two versions of... Uh, of, uh, of, of, of versions of Marx with Jameson, you certainly can uh, hopefully be advanced enough to ask the questions that maybe his Hegelian versions aren't good enough, right? Given your reading in Lazarato. <laughs> anyway, we'll be talking about Foucault and originary uh, accumulation, and then of course racism, and uh, you know, et cetera, and. Uh, uh, et cetera. And then, then we're going to go on to the war machine in terms of the state of war and the wealth of nations of Adam Smith and the state of war. Uh, Jeremy's expert on this, the two histories of the French Revolution. You know, there are probably three, but the two dominant ones, Clausewitz's French Revolution, and then, of course, C.L.R. James and Company, Susan Bucks Morse's uh, rethinking of uh, Hegel in the light of the Santo Domingo uh, slave uprising and the Haitian Revolution. And then we're going to go on to the biopolitics, and this is very important to me, uh, the biopolitics of permanent civil war. So it's not only permanent civil, you know, warfare state, it's a permanent civil war that is going on with the warfare state. And I'll, I'll go back to that in a second. You know, this, this warfare state that I put in the description beginning in 1938 is a way out of the, the uh, you know, described Great Depression. You know, the New Deal wasn't enough to get us out of economic depression. So the warfare state was created in, in terms of this in a very different way and still with us. You know, this, this is who are the beneficiaries of this war right now? Fossil fuels, Raytheon, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Austin, middle name Raytheon, our De Secretary of Defense, you know, et cetera, uh, General Dynamics, you know, the software, computer, um, you know, uh, companies that are actually into, uh, you know, the, the, the crowd, what is it called, the crowd strike, uh, all these kind of mm -hmm. cyber security firms, et cetera, and it's taken on another dimension. So we'll, we'll be talking about that. We'll talk about uh, how the working class has been sequestered in many ways by this new type of warfare in, in a lot of ways. And then we'll do a critique of Foucault's biopolitics and then we'll go on to capture through total war. And remember, I want to go back to Junger for a second. He wrote uh, Total Mobilization, which was a major work on terms of what we're going through today. You know, yeah, yeah. The old adage, a lawyer with a briefcase can steal more money than a thousand people with guns. You know, this total mobilization is always working. We don't know where those you know, what, where are these new weapons, et cetera. So we're gonna look at industrial war, the war against um, socialism, and then of course against communism. 
and then uh, how biopower played into this in some ways, and then you know the military Keynesianism that they address, I think in a very original way. And then we'll talk about from strategy to practical wars, you know, strategy games in the Cold War, um, you know, Cold War Detroit, which will be interesting to people that are interested in unions. Uh, I know Phil will have something to say about this, uh, you know, in the sense of, uh, you know, the UAW, you know, our good friend, Dan uh, Yoriakis, uh, you know, who's passed away uh, recently, wrote, I do mind dying, a study of the, you know, the Detroit auto workers who rose up and, uh, and, uh, you know, anyway, then the uh, underside of the American way of life and the Americanization of the world, which to me is one of the biggest enemies going on. And of course, this propaganda campaign is so full of hypocrisy. This is one of the reasons I'm reading Beth Oram's uh, uh, postings every day to get away from all this propaganda that is nauseating, to put it mildly, you know. Mm -hmm. That I'm going to sit here and hear about, you know, uh, Madeline and Albright, you know, being a, a saint in the world, you know, <laughs> and, you know, et cetera. So anyway, and um, you know, um, so and and then we're gonna we're, we'll sort of end with the Anthropocene uh, war, you know, and 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 maybe get more into um, the war machine of capital, how it's actually related. So we'll be doing we'll be doing a lot of work. I mean, conceptually, et cetera. So um, um, you know, I don't know. Has anybody had a chance to look at the younger? I mean, we can you know go more into depth next week. For me, the interesting part of this setting of the 20th century by younger is really done around this concept of nihilism, right? Of which again. Nietzsche, and you know, if you have the will to power, I would suggest I reread some of it today. Very, very important um, to read uh, uh, this whole section, uh, especially book one, which is European nihilism. You know, if you want to look at this, right, right, right. Um, you know, um, and uh, you know, you see, I mean. Throughout this, you begin to see the, the relationship of Nietzsche, or well, Freud's relationship to Nietzsche, especially through Lou Andreas Salome, but also as a youth when Freud's re reading him. In civilization, it's discontent. It's lifted completely out of, uh, you know, the will to power, you know, displeasure, pleasure, you know, all of these things are playing out Nietzsche in terms of the unconscious, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, and the power of the unconscious. Is that? And then the, the movement of the, the transformation of pessimism into uh, nihilism and how that mm -hmm. happens, how values become scholasticized, bureaucratized, especially in our, in our era through sociology, you know, the sociological imagination, which constructed the social sciences post-World War II. So there are many, many political moments that are going on as well in this 49 as being the first first year that we uh, that we um, um, you know are engaging this. So we're joined by one of our ringers, uh, Patrick. We have David and Patrick here who who are, uh, offer great insights along the way, <laughs> along with Beryl. So yeah, so this is good. Okay. So anyway, um, 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 so um, I, I don't know. I don't know if. Um, if uh, you know uh, you, you've had a chance to read the younger, I mean, it's a good kind of starting point uh, in terms of the nihilism. Again, the trilogy was total mobilization, um, the worker, and pain. These were the three major works of Junger after he wrote Storm, Storm and Steel. And this was a very Nietzschean, conservative Nietzschean individual, if you will, or a singularity who really understood you know, he wrote in his notebooks, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. And if it kills me, I even become even more stronger. So this was the kind of mentality you're dealing with here, you know, in, in a sense with the younger and, and the war machine who had lived it, lived through the trench warfare and understood this very, very, very actively. So, um, um, I mean, it's a shame we don't have minds like this uh, you know, dealing with commentary on the Ukrainian mm -hmm. situation. You know, we've got, you know, uh, um, you know, we have some people, uh, but uh, not, not, not to the level of, of, of younger. So um, again, uh, like I said, to me, this play that he has between Nietzschean, you know, 
crossing the line or across the line into unchartered territory where we begin to see freedom as a value, eros as a value, a new kind of value versus what my good friend Simona Forti has written about the, the Dostoevsky complex, <laughs> right? That suffering is the key to redemption. Right. And going back to the novels such as the Raskolnikov that he mentioned of, of crime and punishment, of course, and then uh, the brothers Karamazov, uh, as well as the idiots and the devils, you know, that play out. So this kind of conflict is younger is shaping in terms of our contemporary situation. 49, then we go to 80 post May of 68 with Deleuze and Guattari's Thousand Plateaus. And then up to the present, uh, actually Aliez and Maserato wrote this in 2018, The Wars and Capital, right? Which I find really good. I mean, you know, uh, just really full of nuggets. You know, we're again reading an aphoristic propositional style, which is very, very, I think very clever for our time. This is not a, a, an essay book kind of chapters. It's a propositional form, right? That unfolds aphoristically almost uh, throughout a very different kind of energy in terms of the reading and the thinking. Very much like Mill Plateau, but a little, a, I think they're a little more logical than Mill Plateau, <laughs> but anyway. So I don't know, have, have, uh, well, a thousand plateaus are used in the French title. So anyway, um, any I mean, anybody uh, comments? I mean, I would suspect some of you have seen a thousand plateaus before. I know that Wars and Capital we haven't read yet, <laughs> right, in any kind of serious way. And uh, certainly Junger, uh, again, Junger also wrote science fiction. You know, On the Marble Cliffs was written on the abyssal plain when in 1939-40, he's really ready to take out, you know, the National Socialists. You know, these, these were fighters, you know, really mm -hmm. people that were in, in the world that wrote, wrote of being in the world. And then, um, um, then he wrote, uh, you know, several uh, uh, attempts at, uh, you know, a kind of utopian uh, speculations afterwards, right? Uh, in which he saw a lot of automated stuff. He saw, you know, the military as becoming insect-like, insect-like mm -hmm. perfection. So he had this metaphor that played out very much as, you know, his own, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, um, you know, uh, uh, fascination and collection of insects that he had. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if you're interested, if you read French, Julien Hevier is his name, had a great uh, series of interviews with Junger. Junger was a cult figure for some people in France, very much a cult figure, you know, for, uh, you know, for, for quite some time, you know, especially because he was, you know, of the generation that liked to experiment with psychedelics and other things. That was one of the come-ons, but in another level, <laughs> someone who lived through both of the great world wars, which we could call imperialist wars. I, again, this language is hard to take that somehow Russia is imperialistic. Uh, you know, I mean, this is not exactly where where Lenin was thinking, you know, when he wrote mm -hmm. imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Again, not that Putin comes out of the Bolshevik tradition. He doesn't. He comes more out of the Stalinist tradition mm -hmm. in terms of the KGB, which is a strange combination of also Dostoevsky in many ways and, and 19th century Russian, you know, literature that has the, the spirit against nihilism, against decadent values that Nietzsche sees in, you know, in, in many ways. So again, uh, you know, just, just to, to deepen this a little bit in terms of reading, if you're interested in these things, I mean, I've been interested in this for a very long time. Uh, you know, the Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, particularly the first two essays in there is a classic work on this, you know, and how did we get to all this morality, this kind of value judgment that we do all the time? Again, a book that incredibly influenced, uh, you know, the early uh, early moments in psychoanalysis, um, from Freud to Otto Rank to Carl Abraham, et cetera, et cetera, and then, um, um, uh, of course, you know, after that. Uh, the, uh, of course, this, this uh, Dostoevsky complex, if you will, right? That meaning is gathered through and consciousness through suffering, right? 
and the pain of suffering. And these two things are meeting, not the Nietzsche doesn't understand pain, but he's not really going towards redemption through a transcendent value or through this. In fact, he would argue with the, 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 uh, the notion of Kirillov uh, character in Dostoevsky, if we kill God, we kill ourselves. For Nietzsche, nothing is further from the truth. We are being killed by the notion of God. You know, this is what's keeping us down. You know, this is a ma major thing. So, so, and everybody knows the story of Dostoevsky, right? That he was facing death. He was before a firing squad for 30 minutes blindfolded and then they let him go. And this was the conversion from a very radical youth into someone who became extremely interiorized you know, the rest of his life, you know, yeah, including the writing of the underground man, which is a, you know, an outright attack on the enlightenment, you know, and its values, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also Dostoevsky had a gambling addiction. Nietzsche, you know, Nietzsche did, did not suffer from those kind of things, <laughs> but, you know, other kind of complexes. So uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, I mean, you know, maybe I could ask from you, uh, you know, just to get started, um, some of the uh, the thinking you have on uh, uh, the current situation. I mean, I, I put the current situation out there. Um, I'm um, again um, um, very interested in this uh, this this um, you know uh, moment of 19. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing dates, if you will, much like the Lewis and Guattari, 49. You know, Truman Doctrine, post. You know, containment. All this the. Marshall Plan, what's going on in Europe, what's dividing, how they're thinking through things, then all the way fast forward to 1980, you know, after a great period of experimentation and a much more experimental work in the Mill Plateau on the war machine in which what is what is really taken on is the state, you know, really interestingly through the nomad, the, no, the war machine is really a nomadic construction, right? In many ways. Yes, uh, good, Phil. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that up too. I was thinking of Sami Amin too on, uh, yeah, 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 about this uh, on the Ukrainian mm -hmm. crisis. Thank you. Yeah. So um, um, anyway, um, um, you know, I, I, again, and then, and then to 2018, Wars and Capital. And if you're interested in Lazzarato, he wrote a book right before this called Capital Hates Everybody. Yes. <laughs> yeah, which is pretty funny. It's right. it's got a great sense of humor. And like I said, they were probably classmates in Deleuze's classes during the early 70s. You know, a lot of us look at the reading capital group, but there was also something else that was happening that we don't read that actively in, in, in France post uh, post 68 um, that uh, uh, Gilles Deleuze was giving classes on these matters, right? Yeah. In fact, you know, Gilles Deleuze, people don't know this, he wrote a, a piece called Why I Love uh, Yasser Arafat <laughs> during that time of the Palestinian situation that Jean-Luc Godard took up in the film here and there, you know, uh, you know, where he juxtaposed the French watching the Palestinian, you know, uh, crisis on TV and then what's really actually going on there. Very, very interesting kind of stuff. But yeah, Deleuze actually was teaching Marx, teaching post um, Post Marx, uh, you know stuff. You know he wrote, he gave a long lecture on space, and we'll talk about smooth and striated space, which is another kind of interesting set of concepts that they're using in this, and very interesting in war and, and war things. And I, I want to say again, I'm I'm no expert on this. I asked an expert to come. We'll see if he comes from Japan, someone that was educated at uh, at uh, at the at West Point, who is, knows military history very well. But I have found it fascinating to study military strategy at this point. You know, during this Ukrainian situation, what's mm -hmm. actually going on in terms of these maneuvers and these reactions, et cetera, right? Uh, what, what's happening. And I, I've been following someone, I mean, he sounds like a character choice, but he's very funny. <laughs> uh, Andre Martyanov, I don't know if you've ever seen him at all, but he's on, uh, you know him, Phil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's very solid. He's ex, he's ex uh, Moscow, uh, you know, uh, 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 member of the, the, the Russian forces, right? And he's followed this very actively. Yeah, you know anything about him, Phil? I mean, you know, beyond, yeah, yeah. 
No, I think he comes out of the Russian Navy, actually. No, the uh, Navy. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. he was, uh, you know, he went through uh, the whole uh, Russian military training schools, you know, and uh, is very familiar with, uh, you know, Russian tactics and strategy. So it, he's interesting. I mean, it, he loves to. <laughs> he loves to just you know rage at people for bullshitting but you know it's his no yeah. he, he's, he's funny he's, he's really yeah. down yeah. down there yeah very very much so a kind of character yeah uh, going on and and, and I, where yeah. do you read where do you find him he has a he has a, a podcast called smoothie <laughs> uh uh, uh, Andre, A N, uh, Andre, uh, like in, in Russian, uh, A N D R uh, E I, and uh, Martyanov, M A R T Y A N O V. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has a, a program called Smoothie. You pick him up on these alternative kind of conspiratorial sites, but intelligent conspiratorial sites, such as uh, uh, the Saker of the Vineyards, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The Voltaire. Uh, that's you know, that's uh, where I've I've read him. Yeah. Read so, yeah, 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 yeah. And Moon yeah. over Alabama, which is pretty good too. Yeah, yeah. And of course, Beth Beth is you know knows knows these sites. Yeah, Beth, Beth Beth is really a local expert. I you know I'm looking forward to a long essay on social media as educational tool, right? <laughs> you know, or how yeah. to use it as educational tool. So. Uh, <laughs> All right. He's also, so, he's also on this uh, right kind of rightist, uh, um, right populist site, the uh, Duran. Uh, they have. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's the problem we're facing. You know, a lot of this that's going on is feeding the right right now. That's that's mm. part of the problem that we're really. Yeah, they, they have a much more uh, intelligent analysis than. Uh, <laughs> Than most people on the left, unfortunately. Yes, the sleepy and company, especially, you know, that, you know, that that's one aspect. And, you know, th th this president, I mean, he's delusional, right? He's saying he's going to go to war with China over Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I mean, he says this publicly. I mean, what what is going on? I mean, what are we really doing? We have a president that sticks out his hands to shake hands with someone that's not there, the empty hand, right? He has nothing but slips. Our ex-president slipping about the invasion was immoral and barbaric, you know, that he did. Bush, you know, he's, he, his unconscious has taken over, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> these guys can't afford people to, you know, help brief them a little bit before <laughs> control their speech instead of letting the will to power of the unconscious mind take over. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, what we're, what we're hearing. So in a way, I don't know, uh, in some ways I, I read and I've had discussions with Josh about this, Nietzsche's eternal recurrence of the same. I mean, we're just living through a parody. It's a, it, unfortunately, it's a, it's a parodic tragedy, right? More, worse than Beckett. But the problem is, this is where we are. And if we don't have laughter, if we don't have what I would just call that, I think Junger goes to and in between the lines, a kind of cheerful nihilism, we're completely <laughs> finished in this, right? So I, you know, I mean, if I am to begin a course like this, uh, you know, if I was going to use an epigraph, I would go to Highway 61 Revisited and say, you know, the broken gambler was mighty bored. He thought about starting the Third World War. He went to a promoter who nearly fell off the floor, said, yes, I've never engaged in this kind of thing before, but yes, I do believe it can easily be done. We'll put some bleachers in the sun and hold it down on Highway 61. And exactly where we are in terms of, a, if you want to look at this as a plateau of where, you know, what, we, what we've come to here even though the nuclear threat is certainly there, right? I mean, we, we know this, this could go at any, any minute and it's being pushed in my opinion. And anyway, people, please feel free to offer dissenting opinions. I mean, you know, I'm not gonna bite, but I, I'm convinced that Zelensky is much more dangerous, you know, in this vein 
than, yeah. you know, the Russian, you know, the, the, the Moscow, right, in, in a sense, right? So maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I'm not there on the scene. But to me, it seems like they're pushing and pushing for this so much, you know, in, in a way. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we also can think of this in terms of allocation, what's going on in this military Keynesianism and why this is a warfare state. 40 to 50 billion, and that's only a little small part of the story, is going to go to the Ukraine where we're facing. That's just the interest on the student debt, you know, that mm -hmm. needs to be dented, right, in this country. No health care system to really write about, you know, and in terms of one over one million reported deaths because of COVID. So all the contradictions, the forces are so, so active in a certain way, you know, that the Nietzschean version of the eternal recurrence of the same, it's much more absurd. Richard Nixon looks like a screaming communist in terms of <laughs> controlling inflation. We're going to do price controls. We're going to do wage controls. Nobody has even put this on the table. It's all about monetary policy, turning off the faucet a little bit. It's going to stop people and prices from rising. Give me a break. The first thing these corporations think about, we're paying more for money, our price is 10%. You know, we can blame it on Putin. We can blame it on this. We can blame it on that. So, and, and Richard Nixon, Wage and price controls looks like a genius. I mean, really, a, a, basically, completely left of center with this this moment, right? In so many ways, yeah. And the other stroke of genius during that period, and again, we've been left behind, is that he eliminated the draft. You know, Rangel was the smartest person. Uh, Jeremy knows this from from Harlem. Charles Rangel says, if you eliminate the draft, you you eliminate the possibility of a movement in the United States. Yeah, you will never have an anti-war movement like you had in the 60s. And it's been proven right, right? Mm -hmm. really, really, in a sense. I was one of the one million people that marched against the Iraq war and half a million people, I did both, Montreal and New York. What what good, you know, yeah. do that, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, very, very important, yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, the WIC, the WIC program. Yes, exactly. Yeah, right. So anyway, this is these are the major contradictions we're facing. But anyway, I, I, maybe we can have an open discussion because I, I know we were a bit belated in getting the, um, the, the readings up and we can do both Junger and uh, Deleuze and Guattari next week if you want. Uh, the Junger is kind of a, a, a setting to the stage. And again, I think it's important understand our world because it's very deep as David had great comments on Moby Dick I remember vividly uh, you know during the anti-Oedipus uh, uh, you know Dostoevsky is worthy of quotation is worthy of citation and thinking through it again even though you might not agree with the politics or whatever and certainly Nietzsche to me is always worth rereading in a sense and you know the more the more you read, you see Theodore Adorno, for example, completely Nietzsche was the, the central figure to him. Marx was second, you know, so it's interesting. So again, we see this historical, um, you know, and, and, and I, I want to put it this way, in terms of background, 19th century background, you're, you're witnessing uh, here with the Mill Plateau, the nomadology, and also that of Wars and Capital by Lazzarato and Aliez, and certainly in Junger, this great conflict that goes on still today between Nietzsche and Marx, right? This is a very interesting thing. And also where they do meet sometimes, you know, this attack upon security, the security principle, this attack on the bourgeoisie, certainly an attack together if they were alive today on the Americanization of the world, right? Uh, you know, mediocrity. You know, uh, throughout. So this is very important to, I think, keep in mind as as we go forward. So any anybody want to say anything? I'm sorry. I, I you know uh, I can you know as you know go on and on about this, and I, I don't want to without some text to work with too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, any any takes on the war? I mean, that's going on today. Again, for me, the first thing that struck me is the level of the hypocrisy the hypocritical propaganda that came down. That's the first re gut, gut reaction I had, you know, and how uneducated people really are in terms of Russian history, right? 
and what some of the stakes were and what has been going on post, you know, 1989, right? In some ways that we've been really in the dark, you know, except for a few people that have put this out, you know? And also, uh, you know, and then the second thing is what is, what is this really about ultimately? And of course I begin to see the strategic war against the dollar, you know, which is starting to happen. Uh, you could become very rich by buying the ruble when all the sanctions were coming down. Now it's it's gone back beyond where it was in terms of the the original uh, you know uh, decline. It's gone back better than it was before the war started. You know you're beginning to see this uh, Eurasian European uh, economic union, the you know the the EA EU right. And uh, yeah, Phil's got it down. Phil, you must be invested, huh? Yeah, and uh, so uh, anyway, um, uh, so, you know, there's a whole different moment going on here in terms of new circuits of economic warfare, economic, uh, you know, uh, mentalities and et cetera. And of course, you can look at China too. I mean, there are reports out that you know uh, they've taken 700 million people out of uh, poverty into the middle class during this reign of the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. So you know, you, we really have to ask some very serious questions here. I'm not about, but believe me, I'm not for state authoritarian capitalism, or you know, with a socialist face, or that it is socialist all the way down. But it certainly has a, been a remarkable economic story, you know. And then, of course, maybe you can read uh, the post uh, Boris Yeltsin, the drunk period in the Soviet Union, post Soviet Union in the Russian Federation, as President Putin giving meaning back to a lot of people there, you know, in some mm -hmm. ways. I mean, what does this mean in terms of the projections? And maybe David could, you know, offer us some, you know, insight into this, how this would work with personalities in, you know, mass psychology and the analysis of the ego and how people choose leaders in, in, in mm -hmm. many ways. So, yeah. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested again in other people's takes. But, you know, again, for me, the guttural reaction of the hypocrisy of the propaganda machine is very, very clear to me, you know, and not that it's not being done on the other side, but the hypocrisy here defies any imagination. I mean, you know, in terms of intelligence, what, what, what's what's going on. And then, of course, uh, and the suppression of people, you know, I mean, you basically have people being taken off Twitter, which is for morons to begin with. I mean, it's unbelievable, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the threats they must have of what Foucault called truth telling, you know, paraisia you know, and, and, and what's, what's happening. And then, of course, I'm very interested in, again, the strategic notion of wars and capital, right? <laughs> that what, what's really going on in this new Eurasian European Union. You know, I've been been reading some of the Soviet thinker. I mean, I'm, I'm using Soviet. I'm sorry, Russian thinkers going forward, uh, you know, what, what their uh, economists are doing now. And, and there is a political and economic calculus happening. Putin's just not a madman who's afraid of COVID mm -hmm. or going crazy. They, they have thought this through. I mean, whether it you know, comes to fruition, whether it's a clear and well demarcated plan, they, that has been thought through. You know, that line has been thought through. So anyway, so let me let me hear from anybody. Uh, I mean, David, I know you have, you know, those that great media studies background and, you know, and all of this, uh, maybe some comments about the propaganda machine and and then David uh, Salvage also about leadership. I, I mean, you know, I'm just trying to play on people's strengths here. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, Michael. Oh, I'm sorry. My, yeah. my, my, my question had to do with symbolism with uh, Zelensky at first, always with the green t-shirt. At first there was like a, a cross, not quite an iron cross, a symbol I didn't realize after that. And uh, now he's back to a, uh, a green t-shirt, whereas Putin is always dressed in a suit. Yeah. So that's my, my question has to do with the symbolism of, of, of how they're portraying themselves. Well, I think Zelensky t-shirts are outselling Che Guevara to give you an idea of the, uh, 
the uh, propaganda at work here. So, uh, uh, so I mean, you know, President Putin is, looks like a serious man compared to a, an actor that was, uh, you know, uh, you know, built up by, uh, you know, a group of, uh, you know, Ukrainian oligarchs, etc. But, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to try not to be so reductionistic, but, but in some ways, it's hard not to be in a, in a sense, uh, you know, what, 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 when you see this kind of thing, why a president of a uh, thing. Welcome, Jane. We're uh, nice to see you. Good. And uh, um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't know, George. I mean, you know, it's pretty clear to me that Putin has a, uh, you know, a, a respectability. You know, he he takes this very seriously. He's not playing so much to the media. You know, I mean, look, the staging of that thing in the open stadium in Russia was very Trump-like. It was very American-like. You know, you can see this in terms of the spectacle. You know, this is no angel. This is not, you know, except, you know, the, this is, uh, you know, uh, 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 out of out of the right wing playbook in a certain way mm. at one level, but on the other hand, the Zelensky to me symbolically is you know they're trying to build him up as this you know warrior fighter mm. on the ground, people's hero, you know the new the Ukrainian Che or the Ukrainian yeah. guerrilla fighter, you know even though you know they show him eating uh, uh, very expensive dinners, right? <laughs> so, you know. You never saw Fidel or Che eating expensive dinners with uh, the Venezuelan ruling class or with the, uh, you know, the, the Mexican petrol operators. Anyway, yeah, so I, I don't know. But let me let me go to David Winters and then to David Salvage just to get on the propaganda and this whole, and then the drive for the leader, you know, again, could be an interesting discussion too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's really, really interesting. Um, uh, there's there's so much to talk about. The uh, one of the things um, uh, I can kind of report. I, I'm at um, I teach. I'm an adjunct at Montclair State, uh, and there's a um, like a discussion list. Somehow the administration there has allowed a, a, a campus wide discussion list number one to exist, which is very interesting. On that discussion list, um, there's been uh, an example of the kind of suppression that you're talking about, Michael. Um, on that, the way that discussion list has gone, there's been exactly one uh, voice that is critical of American and Ukrainian propaganda in the way that you're describing. Mm. That voice is a guy named Grover Fur, who might be familiar to some folks around here. Following this, yeah, we, yeah, we, we know, like Mark Grover, Stern, the show, guy yeah. In the English <laughs> department. Yeah, exactly. That Grover Fur. So Grover is putting up like this resistance all by himself while. Uh, voices from all around the campus are jumping on this disgust list to call him every possible anti-communist slur that you can you can come up with right for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks this has been grover by, and the reason grover's by himself is because of the backlash against him so like i was involved a little bit at the beginning and got a couple emails like quietly thanking me for getting involved um i got like a taste of what grover was getting and i got the hell out of there <laughs> and Grover is Grover Fur. Like he doesn't he doesn't give a shit. He just keeps going. No of course, matter right. how the response go, he just writes, you wrote, and then responds to what they wrote. No matter what they write, Grover just keeps going. So that's like on this disgust list at uh, an instant at a at a university, right? There is one Grover Fur saying what we're saying to ourselves is a bullshit narrative. And he has to say over and over again, I'm not a Putin supporter. I'm just saying that our narrative is bullshit. Mm. And here's all the reasons why. And he's getting, I mean, really, really violently, rhetorically violently attacked for it. So there's there's that that I find like really interesting about the way that I'm, I'm witnessing one of the sort of moments of like the bullshit public sphere, like falling apart, right? In the propaganda uh, sort of machine in the, uh, the intellectual world working. I find it also really interesting as far as the, the media stuff goes, I'll just say uh, one or two things really quickly. Um, like the Frankfurt School's analysis of the way the cliches are mobilized in consumer oh, culture, uh, is like really evident here where like, like Zelensky was immediately described with all of the cliches from like 80s war movies as soon as the war started and as soon as our PR machine decided that's what they wanted Zelensky to be. It's like the literally like out of, of, of shitty movie scripts from 20 years ago, right? Like purposely designed to be very familiar language for the, 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 conceived to be stupid audience that this stuff is strategized for to begin with you know so like the use of cliches is fascinating and farcical and right there in front of everybody 
Um, and also the breakdown, it's not a breakdown, right? It's an affirmation of what journalism in the US really is about, mainstream journalism, which is like a part of the public relations apparatus always, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it becomes so obviously validated in these moments. For example, the two weeks or whatever, where Mariupol was like the center of everything and the heroes of Mariupol were the center story and all that, all the information, videos that were being played on CNN and MSNBC had the Azov brigade, brigades like cited, credited for this video. Yeah. Right. This video brought to you by the fucking Azov brigade, yes. right? So we're like directly funding, like even the folks who say, there isn't a Nazi problem in Ukraine. Still admit <laughs> that the Azov brigades are Nazis, though they just don't consider them a part of the Ukrainian army or whatever. So, like everybody admits that these MFers are Nazis, and for two weeks, CNN and MSNBC were they were the lone citation for information about what was going on in Mariupol. So Very all the stories about the bravery and all that shit. They were basing all of that on the information that they were getting solely from the effing Azov brigades. So yeah, the the I won't go on and on and on about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. About the media's yeah. reaction. Can I just add to that for a sec? Nazis. <laughs> Can I just add one thing to but, that? Yeah, sure. Uh, the thing that was also really weird, as per David's point, is that you know the the thing that uh, initially Grover sent that sparked all this vitriol. I, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact citation. I watched it. It was this extremely measured kind of foreign affairs dude who just gave a, a really, excuse this, but non-ideological breakdown of like NATO and power politics. Um, extremely measured, like just normal, like, I don't know, like a little to the left of like Arthur Schlesinger. It wasn't like <laughs> Grover for like, point by point refutation of Khrushchev, you know, like it was just like normal shit like that would like, you know, like Ralph Nader's friend might have sent along or like, like it was like, know, a uh, or something like Leslie that. Kagan or not even Leslie Kagan, like to the right of like uh, United United for Peace and Justice. Like it was so muted. And also it, it wasn't all rah rah commie either. Like he was just like, hey, I just saw this is pretty measured. Check it out. Like for those you know, who don't know Grover Firth wrote a book called Khrushchev Live. This is his uh, fame. It was based on this book in which he documents everything that Khrushchev lied about uh, uh, Stalin in some ways, right? At the 20th Congress. But and it was so it, gentle. It yeah, was just it was. a gentle recommendation yeah. of this extreme. Right, right. So like Really, the, the hysteria that David, in my opinion, that is cataloging is, is a hysteria against history. Like, that's what it is. It's just like, oh, we don't want any history. We're gonna, and I mean, there's, I mean, I, I like Grover, but they didn't even like attack Grover for the right reasons. He just, they just attacked Grover for like being like, you know, the earth is round and, and these, are, these are some of the powers that are involved. Yeah, the, the 100%. Yeah, Grover yeah. Fur is consistently saying like, um, the victims here are the regular folks in the Ukraine who are trapped between like these warring assholes and like that's his premise and then he tells the story of what's been going on, what happened at Maidan, our involvement in Maidan, the ignoring of the civil war that's been going on since Maidan and exactly as Jeremy said the, the political scientist's name is, is like, I forget, it's like Kirchmeier or something like that, he's like a Yale you know, like normal guy who's like a little bit progressive or whatever and exactly and that was the beginning of what's been like a, a four month ongoing email like uh yeah uh, uh attack so yeah i totally agree jeremy it's exactly as you said right so i mean yeah. there's a cast of characters like that he could have driven driven from like a ludo martins and like you know the belgian communist like that all the anti-revisionist communist party types and like that wasn't it at all it was just like foreign affairs by not a full-on imperialist well, I mean, the scary part here is not even a, a Marxist historical time. It's not even Nietzschean, uh, you know, the uses and the abuses of history or the advantages and disadvantages. There's no monumental history. There's no ancient history. And there's no, there's no uh, uh, critical history at work. There's no history. This is part of the problem. It's made up as it goes along for the propagandistic purposes. It's much more dangerous in some ways, Goebbels, <laughs> again, looks like, you know, I mean, he's a genius in terms of what he's doing. But it, again, it's it's to the point of where there's no historical background here at yeah. all. Nothing, nothing. Yeah. 
And this is the, the most frightening part to me is a, it's a kind of nihilism without that history of nihilism. Why, again, it's a good starting point to begin with Junger, you know, in 49 to point out this is how we got to where we are. You know, this is something that was not invented right, you know, immediately. We know this from, you know, post-World War, you know, United States and, and you know, how the disciplines were formed, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. So, David, would you, I mean, I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but oh, I, I'd no, like to no, just no. talk about, uh, you know, uh, again, one tactic of the media is demonization, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, how dare him, you mm -hmm. know, what a bad boy he is. You know, this is another thing that to me is a dehistorization mm -hmm. of the phenomena itself. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what it ha happens to be, you know, this kind of, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if you want to comment. I mean, I'm not trying to Again, oh, no, no. I, well, I was thinking about what you were saying, and I feel like where it resonates a lot with theories of psychopathology is that it's felt like under severe conditions of stress that the defenses move more towards the more primitive defense organizations, which don't tolerate a wide range of ambiguity. In a more primitive state, people are drawn to binarisms. People are driven more by survival anxiety. People become more desperate. And partly it's felt like what is the anxiety is the lack of connection to their psychological history of saying, I went here, I did that, I went here, I graduated from there, or I didn't graduate from there. What really is my story? And what sort of therapy is trying to give people is sort of a different story that's less concrete of where did you go to school or what building did you live in, but what was happening in your inner state? It's a more complicated, more nuanced sort of a sense of history. So I think the perturbation of history by the media is in some ways kind of deliberately organized to coincide with that event that people experience collectively as your psyches are in chaos because you're disconnected from your psychological histories in so many ways and says, this is going to make it easy for your defenses to consolidate in a particular way that's rather insidious where there's this pressure coming in to say, take out all anxiety of what you don't know. See it this way, it's just simple. We've got a story for you. This is a really simple narrative, just cling to it. And also, it allows the regression for the person to say, God, you know, it's scary times between the economy and COVID and crazy things going on. You know, it would be lovely to just feel childlike and say, there is some figure I could believe in in a much more absolute way where my own anxieties are just held up in a ball of saying, it's about them. They have that power. Right. I want them to, because I'd love to find that idealized adult who is all-knowing and all-powerful. It's so primal. It's so universal. Interesting. So, so the, the, the strategy of propaganda ultimately is consistent infantilization, right? Uh, and, and, you know, in that infantilization, the, the, the room that makes it possible, again, is this lack of historical knowledge or historical time. And, and it can't, the time can't come in. Yeah. Because the way the media presents itself is as an eternal otherness. The person is out there, they're on a screen, they're bigger, they're larger. So that also persists an endless idealization that can never go through a real working through, which you could if you could meet the person and sit down with them or legislate with them or participate with them at you know small governmental meetings that showed scale and showed them in action and you could see their feet of clay. This promotes this other kind of defensive thing. It's primitive because it binds up all my aggression on someone who's doing this stuff, but it's also taking away other things of saying, I see it only one way and there's a relief to that. It's sort of like a film like Fight Club. It got out the idea where it was so depressing, but it was easier for Ed Norton's character to think of the world in this kind of negative Nietzschean way of him as the absolute reverse of the Ubermensch, and that the only real Ubermensch could be Tyler Durden. <laughs> you know, there was a kind of a fetishistic yeah, thing that's, that's, there of saying, I, I am connected to this particular reality. I can only, only see it this way, which brings in a lot of later Freud when the idea of the vertical splitting of the ego, where his sense was every sexuality was perverse and hence everyone's mind was a little bit drawn towards registering reality in a particular way. Henry James novels are filled with this of heroines who sort of know something's wrong, but they sort of don't. So they go forwards and marry the wrong people and they do the wrong things because they see it, but they don't really see it. I think the media is just a master at pulling in that kind of vertical split by saying, we're just so skilled at showing you what you want to see. The colors, the length of the commercial, how long it should be there, what 
kind of music it should have that creates this whole different scenario for you is going to totally work with your vertical split to say the one that you're more connected to we can reverse that to connect you in this totally other way mm -hmm. so i could see this i have so many friends i love who really feel that barack obama is a total saint <laughs> but if you do show them it's coming from the media of films like michael moore's fahrenheit 11 9 which shows you him pretending to drink water in Flint, Michigan, which shows you very frail actions in many ways, him arranging war games over Flint, knowing it had a very disenfranchised population that were never going to protest those. These are not dumb people. They're very politically sophisticated in some ways, but most of them just still have a bit of this idea that he was sort of superhuman and Jesus-like. And it's like, well, you know, let's get real. <laughs> you know, no, yeah. you've gone for the fetishistic reality there. It's like my friend who said Madeleine Albright said President uh, Putin looked like was very reptilian when she met him <laughs> and saying that this was a, a bad thing. She read his character. I said, I think Madeleine Albright was projecting at that moment and <laughs> right. that be looked at, you know, in terms of the reptilian uh, nature of this. Yeah. No, this is good. This is good. Uh, yes, I mean some other people. I mean, yeah, I mean, really, in a way, we're 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 really living in this. And I, I think that when we get to wars and propaganda, and particularly strategic games and wars and capital, this will be fleshed out even more. It'd be very interesting to look at this how we get from strategic games, you know, and of course video games, which is a big big culture now. But I mean, you know obviously training. Phil, you wanted to say something? I see you're just unmuted, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really kind of distressed me about this whole period is that I have so many friends who I can't even talk to now. You know, I mean, it's it's really people that were comrades on the left that, uh, you know, if I start to say anything, uh, you know, they'll call me a Putinist or a, uh, you know, uh, just <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. really, go, I mean, really scream in my face, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's rather distressing. I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. And the propaganda is just, uh, it's just like they make it up, you know, <laughs> I don't know. David wrote <laughs> on to something how well they can play to the lack of ambiguity that is really working in this vertical splitting that he refers to. That's very important because that 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 split is where the light is coming in for the media to really shine because people want quick answers. They want that mediated, mediatized, uh, you know, response in a very, very active way, you know, and this is part of what Marcuse would call repressive desublimation, of course, you know, it's another kind of libidinal cathexis that, you know, is very easily done. I like her, I like him, I like, you know, it, right, et cetera, you know, very immediate. It's an immediate reaction. And this becomes very easy for people to go to because the hard work is to try to understand again you know the, you know the you know we we all love the thesis on uh, Feuerbach uh, the 11th thesis you know the point uh, you know the philosophers have interpreted the world the the second part of course the, the point is to transform it but really what's being missed in all of this is the the understanding the verstandung how do we understand things right and this is really the hard part and, you know, in a sense, it goes to show you how dehistorization, which is a product, I think, of the educational institutions, you know, this moment towards job readiness, vocational mm -hmm. programs, all of this has participated in the destruction of the humanities during the last 20 to 30 years, the administrative class that's in education, all this is contributing more and more to a very homogenous, right? One dimensionality that is very hard to take through. For Phil to say that his friends on the left, and I, I know some of them, and and, you know, et cetera, and people that have, you know, struggled for most of their life, or they're breaking up friendships, or they're so narrow minded on this that they can't have discussion, goes to show you how effective this really is, you know, how and, effective it is. And I, and think, I think they can't get out of the framework of, uh, you know, of, of the, uh, the, the sort of national liberation struggles, you know, I mean, they're, they're kind of trapped in, in, that, in that frame. Right. And, and they and they're really I don't know 
It's it's crazy. Hey, hey, Beryl, are you um, aware of uh, this group in Australia called uh, Honest Government? <laughs> I've heard <laughs> of them. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> what a, talking about lack of ambiguity. I mean, we don't <laughs> tell me about them, Phil. Okay, I'll I'll drop the link in uh, in cool. the chat. Yeah, um, yeah. And they're, they're really funny. They're really good. good. Oh um, yes, 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 yes. I do. Yeah, yeah. They put out all those videos. Yeah, they're yeah, wonderful. Yeah, they put out a mm. yeah, they're great. So okay. I'll, I'll drop the link in the chat. Yeah, one of the things that I've been thinking. I mean, you know, we're a client state, right? Of of you guys, oh, yeah. and our sort of leaders. And including the ones who have just taken over, are uh, totally in lockstep. And the, the, the sort of discourse about the heroic Ukrainian people is, you know, just absolutely everywhere taken for granted. There was some young man from, I think he was a student at the University of Melbourne, who early on in the war at a, a, a national broadcast, a thing called Q&A, where you know you get this lineup of experts and politicians and an audience of so-called ordinary people this young man asked a question about the breaking of the agreement on nato that was made you know at the breakup of the soviet union and whether this had any bearing on the russian invasion he was actually asked to leave you know he was thrown out of the audience be on the grounds that it was upsetting people. You know, there were Ukrainians in the audience, Ukrainian Australians, and they were upset. So this guy was turfed out on national television for asking what was an incredibly kind of <laughs> mild mannered question based on history. Um, you know, we don't want history. We just want the heroic Ukrainian people. And the stuff about the Azov Brigade is, is just classic, yeah. And, and the other thing that goes here is how can, how can anybody possibly say that there are Nazis in the Ukraine when they had a Jewish president? You know, how is this possible? That's the best part, yeah. That's the best part, yeah. yeah. And of course here, not, and you know, I, I won't go on about it because it's, it's not primarily to your concerns, but the immediate link here was made to, well, if the Russians can invade the Ukraine, then the Chinese can invade Taiwan. And what are we going to do to stand up to the Chinese? You know, we've got one warship that couldn't deliver aid to Tonga. Um, it broke down, you know, it lost its power. But we're standing up to the Chinese. I mean, it's, it's just mind boggling, the delusion. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm. And I mean, again, going back to what David Salvage was saying earlier, mm you know, about this vertical splitting and what it yeah. does, this inability to tolerate ambiguity. Again, everybody just falls into this trap and everything's going to be okay. Yeah. The omnipotent <laughs> United States will save the day. Mm. Top Gun will win an award at Cannes yes. for the, the redoing of the Tom Cruise movie, right, yes. et cetera. And yes. everything's going to be better. We're going to do the Born Conspiracy number five, yeah. in which is going to all save this. We can already see this playing out on the Hollywood screens, yes. et cetera. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very clear in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, the hypocrisy, no one has talked at all about the shock therapy that Russia went through. And uh, mm -hmm. this is why I wanted to go back to Putin mm -hmm. and this ideal, why he becomes this ideal type to a good portion of the Russian people. This is not an unpopular mm -hmm. president, right? Mm -hmm. And again, we hear how unpopular the war is. I, don't, I mean, I'm not so sure about that. Maybe internally it is that they want more force. And I know that there's rumblings within the Kremlin. But at the same time, uh, you know, where does this come from? Where does this desire come from to have a leader such as Vladimir Putin and, you know, and that, 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 that crowd, you know, in a sense. And, you know, he's the first to break up Western oil uh, uh, monopolies too, you know, as you know, right? I mean, he broke up the early uh, moments of Gazprom, you know, and, and nationalized it. You know, he took care of some of his friends, but at the same time, you know, this is a country that went through unbelievable pain, 
you know, mm. from 1991. Everybody's up in arms about the cost of gas in North America. I mean, they have no idea how nice they have it. Inflation here. I mean, some of these countries are going through, you know, you think about your prices going up fourfold instead of 10, 20 percent, you know, at the at the at the stores. So this is very real, this this whole thing of the shock therapy in which Putin came in and he actually created a middle class. You know, and, and this is this is something not talked about at all. You know, what what where are the values? And instead, you know, as as David again opened the door on, this is the perfect time to bring in the demon, right? <laughs> How can you demonize someone, right? How does it happen? You know, you know, uh, you know, and uh you know, how do you phenomenalize this this demon at, at, the, at this point? That, that so, actually, yeah. I mean, there, there are a couple of readings that I've been sure, doing sure, lately sure, about please. this. I mean, Leo Lowenthal, Prophets of Deceit, which actually right, was well. republished by yeah. Verso Press, yeah. I mean, talks about the construction of fascism or construction, construction by, and very similar in terms, in terms of David. I, in some ways, think that if, if the Ukrainian war didn't happen, they would have to create it to basically shore up the kind of ide ideology within like capitalism because, hey, the wheels are coming off. That's mm -hmm. one reading that I've been doing. The other one is Michael Hudson's work. He just yeah. published a recent book. And Hudson's, his, his obsession is with the third volume of capital and the financialization of the economy. And the way how is this playing out globally? And, and, and I just want to just, just, these two things just kind of- No, kind of, right. No, it's great you're going there. Yeah, yeah. That, that I think these, and, and I think that Hudson raises some interesting issues about that we're essentially, the neoliberalism is kind of reached an end point to a certain extent, and the rest of the world and Russia, China, et cetera, are operating with a different model. Hudson makes the argument that essentially what happened is that we, the United States, I'm not sure if people are familiar with his work, but the United States, well, basically Western Europe, the West, took a different track. That, but what the point that Hudson makes is that the Chinese, in fact, may be taking a track which is more closer to the one that actually, that Marx anticipated in the third volume of Capital. I'm not sure that's right. But it's still something to consider. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, what, uh, bringing up Michael Hudson, who's a well known Marxist economist, his first book was called Super Imperialism, mm -hmm. where he looks at the SDR, you know, the special drawing rights, the Nixon, you know, taking us off the gold standard, you know, and he looks at this in a very clever, interesting way. He's got a whole thing. It was part of the Delphi Declaration on the Greek debt as well, and, and now has done significant work on volume three, as uh, Patrick mentioned, especially chapter 25, fictitious capital. You know, and what is fictitious capital? It's capital that is not tied to the mode to production, to, to productive forces, right? And in some ways you have this, well, I forgot her name, Kelton, Stephanie Kelton, the Bernie Sanders and that, uh, uh, a person, she, she's the one who, speaks to money making money. It doesn't matter how much you print, right, et cetera. Well, that's- Modern monetary cool. theory. Yeah. I'm sorry, monetary mm -hmm. theory. Yeah, modern monetary theory. MMT, yes, exactly. So so anyway, th no, this is all very interesting. That And Hudson has taken this side. You know, remember, Putin wants to tie the ruble to gold. You know, they want to they bring back the gold standard. So maybe the two different paths that take place during capitalist stagflation, which Ernst Mandel used to refer to as the second slump, the one that, you know, went until 73, until Nixon takes you off the gold standard. And then monetary policy brought to you by Uncle Milty from uh, University of Chicago, Friedman and company takes over during the Reagan, you know, uh, era, right? And we're still with this quantitative, you know, easing and now quite a quantitative tightening is the, is the model that's happening here. So this is very interesting. Hudson's very good at this, showing you two different directions.
dimensions of where finance capital or financialization could be moving in, in some ways. And, you know, and, and China has a lot, you know, holds a lot of debt on the U.S. too. Mm -hmm. This is another thing. This is much more intricate than meets the eye. It's China and Russia against us versus us against them. There's a lot of intricacies in between and we'll, we'll talk more about this when we look at models of science you know what what Deleuze and Guattari and an uh, ex-professor of mine Reiner Sherman would call the disparate you know uh, elements that we forget we're always doing the comparative you know which is a, a, a strategy of the law of analogy as well as a strategy of uh, you know dominant science right or the science of learning things so we'll look at disparate in this in this regard. So I'm really glad you brought that up, Patrick. Yeah, Hudson's worth listening to, and uh, you know he studies a lot of. Uh, I think his name is Gladiev, uh, the uh, the economist, the Russian economist, who is uh, basically the architect between behind the uh, European. Um, excuse me, I'm messing up. European Eurasian Economic Union versus the European Union, and you know I mean I, some of the phrases that come out from Pepe Escobar are very interesting. Okay. Europe is suicidal, you know? This is a suicide mission. The latest thing is Italy, Draghi is off, they're, they're offering plans to, to solve this, a peace plan coming from Italy of all places, right? So th this, this again, you know, shows you what's really at stake here, you know, in so many ways. Yeah, yeah, Phil, you want to, again? Yeah. yeah, I mean, Hudson also wrote a fair amount on, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin's attempt to wrest the uh, uh, the Russian economy back from the oligarchs, right. you know, and to gain control, you know, to gain state control over it again, you know. Um, so it's kind of interesting, right? No, yeah, and I mean, look, if you if you follow uh, equity and speculative markets, you know, finance capital markets, you know, there's been an assault on Bitcoin and Ethereum and all the cryptocurrencies at this point. This is an attempt by Western speculators to not let this emerge as part of an alternative currency in some ways. Will this continue? We don't know. You know, that's another thing. You know, you get even, you know, everybody's coming out now. You've got Jamie Dimon of Citibank saying, oh, this isn't going to last long, the recession, <laughs> you know, et cetera. So you're beginning to see a different kind of propaganda at work that the Americans, you know, in this Americanization of the world can't take pain for too long. This is a very interesting moment here in a sense. So nothing is to be learned. This is, this is, I think, the lesson that David Salvage is giving us, you know, through the psychoanalytic interpretation. You know, the pain is just too much, right? We can't take it. So we're, we're, we're basically receptacles of this, of this uh, you know, propaganda industry and apparatus that is so vast. I mean, it's just everywhere, you know, anywhere. And, you know, I mean, I, I can't talk to certain friends. They cut me off on the phone if I even bring up the subject. Oh, Michael, you don't believe that. You don't, do you really? No, oh, come on, come on. How can that be true? You know, et cetera. I said, well, I witnessed the, you know, uh, daily uh, Vietnam uh, reportage and the My Lai uh, massacre and the Gulf of Tonkin Tonkin incident. And this has been going on really since the great, uh, you know, who wrote the devil's chessboard on the, the Dulles brothers? Uh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, uh, you know, you know uh, who Beth? It was David Dan Talbot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Anyway, I mean, you know, this has been going on since day one, since the OSS to the uh, uh, yeah. And I, again, this great line from the Good Shepherd when Joe Pesci, you know, plays the Italian American being interviewed or being asked a favor by the uh, the uh, CIA, Matt played by uh, Matt Damon uh, in the Good Shepherd. And the, the, the Pesci says, we did this. And even the blacks contributed, they didn't use blacks, he used another word, you know, contributed this to the United States. What do you people do? And he says, we're the United States of America and you all are just visiting. And this is the mentality, really, in a sense. When you read, I read this week, I read the RAND uh, corporate, the, the report, right, for the second time. Yeah, and, 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 and this is because of Beth sent it around. <laughs> Again, um, um, you know, very important to see no lessons are being being uh, being learned at all. And I mean, how how stale the thinking the think tank is, right? 
that they're somewhat back in 1940. You know, again, a good reason to begin with um, to be begin with uh, um, uh, Ernst Jünger, 1949. There's been no imagination of that, no lessons learned. And if you really think about the United States, what war have we won since? You know, we didn't win World War II. That was one of the Battle of Stalingrad. You know, we lost Korea, right? <laughs> we had a massacre where, you know, I mean, Phil knows this very well, the, the, uh, the, the Guatemalan uh, uh, moment, right, in the 50s, right, on top of many other moments, you know, that are, you know, even more hidden. And then, of course, we go into the, the, the 60s with Vietnam. Did we win in Iraq? Uh, you know, or did we win in any of these places? Desert Storm, what did that prove, et cetera? What, where are we after all of this? So really, the thinking is basically still the same. It's stuck. It's stuck in stone. But people believe it as long as you can have like, you know, uh, you know, next door, the, the, the person has a BMW or, a, you know, Mercedes, everything is all right in the world, right, in, in, in a sense. And this is part of the, 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 the come on. And, and you know, uh, so, uh, again, I, I think it's very important we, uh, we try to think this through. And please, I, I, I'm, again, I'm not a supporter of, you know, uh, Putin's regime, right? I, I don't want to go back to ultra nationalist positions of the 19th century, in a sense, or, you know, the reign. I have great admiration of Catherine the Great. You know, you know the story with Denny Diderot, right? That she, she basically, she knew Diderot needed money and he was broke. And so she offered to buy his library. And in buying his library, she said, you will use it as the great scholar as you will while you're still alive. But when you die, it comes to me. That was her, you know, treatment of the Enlightenment. Catherine the Great, who was very Westernized. And, and he good... slapped her on the knee. That was yes. the point of it all. He slapped her on the knee. Well, that, uh, okay, George, <laughs> I needed that. Uh, that yeah. So anyway, um, so, you know, so, so Putin has this in mind, you know, this kind of uh, uh, zardoms in, in some ways, but on the other hand, it's very real. It's part of the real politique that we're living in. And, you know, and this is another thing that I think the left has to think through. This is a very different moment, you know? I mean, you know, I'm on the board of the left forum, whatever's left of it, you know, and I would like very much for us to bring some special people as speakers. And I would invite, and I know I'd have a hard time doing, Pepe Escobar, you know, should be a plenary speaker, you know, even though he's not a, you know, total leftist and, you know, being in, in the, you know, and I would have him debate uh, Yanni Varoufakis, who knows the, the limitations of NATO, but you would have this kind of, you know, different kind of moment. Yeah, Pepe Escobar is, uh, it's not Pablo, yeah. I, I used to make, I made mistakes with Pablo, but we can resurrect Pablo too, if you want. Yeah, he said he could be part of the cryptocurrency uh, moment. But anyway, all Who's to say- Pepe Escobar? Pepe Escobar is a Brazilian journalist. Jeremy, I'm surprised at you. Yeah, 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 I mean, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Pepe, Pepe Escobar is a Brazilian journalist who's been, been very much on the scene for a long time as a roving reporter. He writes for the Asia Times. He has a, he has a, a column called The Cradle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think they've, uh, I think he and the Asian Times may have parted ways, but uh, the, you know, he's still writing in The Cradle. Um, the uh, he's been banned for life from uh, Twitter. <laughs> they put Scott Ritter back on, but uh, Pepe has been yeah, yeah. You yeah. you can read him on the Sacker. Um, he's regularly there. The Sacker of the Vineyard, yeah. which is and another you can, you alternative. Can, you can subscribe to his Telegraph channel. Yes, yes. So it's Guy, <laughs> guy's got to make a living. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's very good. I mean, he's very articulate. And by the way, he gave a presentation, if you're interested in how the world economic order is beginning to take place, you can begin to, you will see that he's, uh, he has a very good presentation in 2015 of the Silk Road and what's at stake, you know, in the North. He has an excellent, with the maps and, 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 and yeah. Maps and all. Yeah, very good one hour presentation of what maybe, you know, the China Russia axis will look like in that part of uh, Russia, you know, et cetera. 
you know. So anyway, uh, yeah. But I mean, I, this is good as opening, you know, to try to get, you know, some of the propaganda out of the way or show how the apparatus is, I think. So has anyone read Junger before uh, here or any any relationship? No. Okay. This was uh, Heidegger's good friend after the war, right? Again, a novelist, a soldier. He invented an insect, you know. Uh, he became, like I said, a cult figure to some uh, young people, in, in especially in France and Germany, post-World War uh, II, uh, you know, as a cult figure, uh, experimented with psychedelic drugs, you know, was early participant in LSD from uh, from uh, Hoffman LaRoche when, you know, it was uh, the good stuff, so to speak, uh, you know, more, more um, you know, out there in a different way. Um, so, um, yeah, and I, the reason, again, I chose them, I think we forget that, you know, the two revolutions of the 20th century are still going on in some ways, right? And we don't know where the third will be, you know, in, in a sense, or if there is that third path. But the conservative revolution, very important because you'll see in Lazzarato and in um, uh, Aliez's book, that Carl Schmidt plays a, a role, right? The state of exception very important. And those of you who read Giorgio Gombin understand what an important concept that is. And certainly another importance for, of course, the Patriot Act, you know, in, in, in uh, the post 9-11 uh, 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 moment, you know, the state of exception that is invoked. So, uh, you know, this is very important, uh, you know, the Schmidt, you know, who to me was the le least of the thinkers, Heidegger, who did not consider Junger a thinker, but considered in Junger a poet and a writer of rank. And then of course, Heidegger is, you know, uh, as part of the conservative re revolution. As most of you know, Heidegger was not allowed to teach as part of the denazification program um, in Germany. Uh, he was then finally put back on. He was at salary though. Um, and he was finally able to teach in the 50s again, but he, he maintained this correspondence and this relationship with Junger, you know, uh, during, uh, you know, during the 40s from 45 forward. Again, I recommend, um, you know, uh, uh, that uh, Nietzsche again becomes this philosopher. By the way, there's going to be a historical materialism issue devoted to Domenico Lusordo's uh, work on Nietzsche, the aristocratic rebel coming out, uh, you know, uh, which is going to be very interesting because Lusordo is a Marxist historian who delves very deeply into Nietzsche, etc. I won't read you what he had to say about the commune, but you, you know, right, about the Paris Commune. This was, a, a, again, another breaking point. But Nietzsche looms very, very actively behind all of this, and certainly behind, you know, the deleuze Guattarian approaches too, because Nietzsche is a thinker of movement as well. He's not only just a thinker of, uh, you know, the will to, you know, he's really thinking movement. And, and I think this is something we need to, to understand as well, that he has logistics in mind. Another thing that's going to be very interesting going forward, you know, to riff off of Junger, Junger was an active participant. He was a soldier. He was a warrior. Like I said, he was thinking of the warrior worker, you know, as part of a new movement, uh, you know, uh, you know, and again, Nietzsche wanted the new aristocracy, which was a kind of return to the noble notion of the warrior, like in ancient Greece before the noble base, you know, for Nietzsche, Socrates was the enemy. He gave the rabble voice, right? <laughs> you know, before that things were different in the pre pre Socratic or before Socratic Socrates' time. So anyway, I, I, I want to position that somewhat because it's very influential here in terms of alacrity, speed, and movement. You know, in warfare, and we're going to see some distinctions in Deleuze and Guattari, which are very interesting in terms of game theory. Chess is a game of the state. Go is the game of guerrillas, right? <laughs> and the encompassing. And what kind of military strategies are built around this as well? Smooth and striated space. Royal science versus people science. We're going to see these kind of, I, I wouldn't really call them binaries, but new kind of conceptual, you know, movements, if you will, tensions that are that are put out by Deleuze and Guattari. But they are playing off of conservative revolution. They are playing. 
rewriting it in a very imaginative way. And then when we get to wars and capital, we'll begin to see a, a different uh, thing. How about people reading of Lazzarato? Anybody read? Uh, I guess uh, David Winter said he has read. Uh, what did you read? Making of Indebted Man? Or, or which ones did you read? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, Yeah. sorry. Um, I've read a bunch of Lazzarato. I'd have to look at my shelf. I've read um, uh, Signs and Machines, right? That's one. Yeah. Um, yeah, the making of a dead man, uh, capital hates everyone. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe an article well, or two. Very important thinker, yeah, to, to me for today. Yeah, very important. And again, someone educated in that what I consider a very precious moment in thinking the early 70s, you know, when people were still, you know, reeling in the years, if you will, from uh, from uh, the 1960s. And there was a lot out there, a lot of energy, you know, in terms was, of thought. And thought was Lazzarato one of the guys who was in, uh, one of the people who was in France with Deleuze because he was running, uh, like, out of Italy? He was... Yeah, he was part of the uh, Italian autumn movement. Yeah, right. The, so like right. he had to be. He was Italian with autumn. The time. He yeah. was with the Luz because he couldn't be in Italy during that time. That's correct. Yes, 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 exactly. And uh, yeah, so yeah, he was part of that. Uh, Diaz was a academic, very smart academic, uh, or is still out yeah. there. And Lazarotta wrote a, an interesting essay on immaterial work or immaterial labor. Yes, and it's in a book called. But radical thought in Italy. Yes. That, yes. that essay is how um, Lazzarato gets into media studies, or at least how I read Lazzarato within media yeah. studies is immaterial literary. Yeah. He comes out of the Negre, uh, Piperno, Tronti group of, uh, you know, autonomy uh, yeah, uh, uh, and that movement, uh, you know, who, who to me made the major contributions to, you know, the history of Marxist thought, if you will, real thinkers during the 70s again you know, in, in, in a sense. But yes, they ended up in Deleuze. Deleuze also wrote the letters to, to free Negre, to, to let Negre be in France, right? He also was very close. You know, Negre's sponsor in Paris was Felix Guattari. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was the sponsor to get Negre into, into Paris. And, you know, these people, you know, they, they knew a lot about the warfare state, yeah. So anyway, what, one thesis I want to advance here is that the warfare state continues and without thinking the warfare state, I don't think we know where we are. You know, I mean, you know, in a sense there were, uh, you know, 90, 94 years, I mean, you know, almost, uh, excuse me, 80, 84 years since it was constructed the way it was, uh, you know, by Franklin Roosevelt and the United States in a way. And unless we understand this and we don't, and unless we understand the transference of Nazi ideology, Nazi brain power, right? Coming into the United States, we're missing a lot about where, who we are, right? You know, and you know, Kubrick's movie is, is a satire, but it's a serious, serious work. Uh, you know, Dr. Strangelove, right? Very serious work, you know, and, uh, and, uh, you know, th this is very important to keep in mind, including, and, you know, David and Jane can attest to this, the Americanization of psychoanalysis, that this mm -hmm. was played very actively with the Lawrence Cubies in some ways. And then, of course, you know, certain kind of culturalist psychoanalysis, assimilationist psychoanalysis, the repression of Otto Fenichel and the round table, which still had a critical force, who were watched very carefully and FBI files were kept on them. So this is another moment. And of course, Rebel, you know, I just picked it off my shelf. I have it here. Rebel with a cause, Richard Linder, who died very early, but was a very radical psychoanalyst who had many people who worked with the State Department and the, de the Defense Department as, 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 uh, as patients, right? Linder had that, that you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, caseload which is very interesting uh, too, to think about, you know, and Linder was a maverick outside of this, of this, of, of this, uh, of this culture. So the last to, to really fight against the Americanization of psychoanalysis and of course, lay analysis, Theodore Reek and, and company, which Freud intervened on. But this Americanization of psychoanalysis and making it into the discipline, you see where Lacan, you know, started on all this. I mean, you know, and made in USA psychology, right? And, no, and no. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So, uh, you know, and how it became very conformist. And I think this is something that also runs through wars and capital, how capital has this ability to produce conformity at almost any moment. You know, this seems to be, you know, part of the Foucaultian, you know, normalization, you know, part of the, you know, the, the notion of how mental illness, madness is constituted, et cetera. So we'll, we'll get into that too uh, during war. And I, I guess you, most of you know the great anti-war movie, King of Hearts, that the only people that see that war is good for absolutely nothing are the mental patients. Right, Al, Alan Bates leads the, the, the revolt, right? And, you know, so this is very interesting in some ways to think about it th that way, you know, in, in, in terms of the, the signposts and, 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 and in a sense. So anyway, I guess, I guess well, you know, so anyway, I, I, I'd love to hear more of the reading. Uh, you know, Patrick, have you read any uh, Lazzarato besides Immaterial Labor? Just uh, any of his other works or no? That's it, that's, that's it. it. Okay, no no problem, yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, this is this is a collaboration. It's a very healthy collaboration. Again, the form is interesting to me. It's propositional. Um, you know, it's um, it's done in, uh, you know, kind of an aphoristic style filled with nuggets. There's a very interesting critique of Foucault, you know, and the biopolitical that Foucault opens up, uh, you know, in this book. There's a, a privileging of Sylvia Federici early on that the first war is against women. And we're going to see this in Deleuze and Guattari beforehand, because I really like what they do with Kleist, who's forgotten. Uh, Jeremy knows Kleist. They use Penthesilia against Goethe and Hegel, right? So this kind of opens up this anti-Hegelian dialectical thinking through literature, through the play, Penthesilia, which is very interesting. You know, Penthesilia was the, the capturing of, uh, of uh, Achilles, right? To teach the Amazon women how to fight, right? In, in a sense, he was captured for that purpose, the great warrior. But Achilles remains a man of the state Whereas the Amazon women do not, right? They become part of the nomadic war machine. So we're gonna we're gonna look at these kind of historical, you know, parameters and try to frame it, you know, alongside capital and you know how we how we actually could fight capital. I mean, I, to me, these books are weapons. They're not they're not to be just enjoyed, you know, on Zoom sessions. These are weapons we should be able to use and employ in terms of our own struggles where we are because. You know, heaven knows I use that very much in a cliched way. Uh, but anyway, knows what we're, what we're, how desperate, you know, and despairing we really are at this point where we're, where we are, given this, you know, and, you know, Nietzsche called, and this is very interesting vis-a-vis uh, -vis Freud, nihilism was the most uncanny of all get guests, right? The most uncanniness of all this, the unheimlich of all our hospitality, you know, to let in the door. And he, he really opens this up. And I, again, I really love this style. You know, I know a lot of myself included very much influenced by the three volumes of capital theories of surplus value, et cetera, the late mature Marx. But in a way, this style is very different and very, I think, in some ways liberating, you know, in terms of seeing, you know, a different kind of, uh, you know, semiotics as what, at, at, at work, uh, you know, in, in terms of giving us better insights. And, you know, the old Marxist, you know, um, Freudian synthesis doesn't seem really to work, right, in a way, but it's being borrowed. It's not an either or, right? And it's not a synthetic ground only, but it's a both and, right? Where it's appropriate, right, in, in some ways. So again, this kind of cross and transdisciplinary approach is, is much more, I think, fertile than just, you know, saying one or the other, or these are where the contradictions are, you know, in, in, in some ways, uh, is, is very important to keep in mind. But uh, I, I really I, think, yeah, 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 please, David, yeah. yeah, yeah I could, yeah. Like, one of the parts of, uh, of the book that I'm looking most forward to, to kind of getting yeah. into and discussing is yeah. the framework that they introduce between like, the way that they sort of split and put in conflict with each other capital, the state, the war machine, and then uh, liberatory movements. And, and like the way that like the state, capital and the war machine are, are in a way always antagonistic with liberatory movements, right? Movements of like 
so wars of race, of gender, of subjectivity, especially, right, is, is really the wars of subjectivity are really interesting. And the ways that capital, the state and the war machine are sometimes like competing over control of one another, right? Like the war machine and capital competing over the state and at, at sometimes like one or the other has an advantage or the state taking it uh, like having um, an advantage over capital and the war machine during certain periods, the way that they periodize through that sort of moving dynamic of those like shifting antagonisms and and like dominations and subordinations is, is fascinating to me. I'm really interested in how we like use that framework to see the stuff that's going on around us right now. It's really a fascinating framework to me. It feels like um, David Harvey made like an, a similar kind of attempt in like two or three books ago where he talks about like he, want, he tries to get away a little bit from, from David Harvey's, you know, capital worker kind of split to like, he, he talks about seven or nine spheres that like conflict with each other or line up with each other. And Lazzarato and Elias in, in this do what I, I think is a, a more sophisticated and more tight kind of conceptual framing that like splits the antagonists into this really interesting constellation and then shows almost periodizes according to which according to the stages of like that terrain of battle as it, as it forms over a century and a half or, or, or from like year zero of capital, which they mark at 1492, right? From, from year zero on through. So I love the framework that they use. I'm really interested in, in getting into that. With everybody. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I wanna just make one comment about the war machine. The war machine in the nomadic sense, right? In the Deleuzean, Guattarian sense, is really where we are. We are the war machine. <laughs> We're going against, right, the state and the state apparatus, capital and the state. So the war machine becomes a kind of, you know, effort, right? This is why, you know, the liberal, the liberal left are always enemies. They don't understand that we're really creating war machines. You know, when Deleuze or George Jackson says, you know, parroting, I mean, uh, you know, citing George Jackson, I'm looking for new weapons. We must invent new weapons. That is what the war machine is really doing. That's what the nomadic is versus that of the state. And, you know, reason in a way is an enemy. I'm not saying we should get away from logical reason. That's not the point. But the point is, is to understand how that reason plays out the logos versus the nomos. Right. So this is another thing that they're doing. Nomos in the Greek really means, you know, the nomadic and the and the and the, and the and the movement, right? In a sense, right? And also custom, right? And the making of the law versus that of the logos, right? Of the state, right? And and nomos and fusus are the original opposition, you know, the the, the movement and the nature, right? So in a sense, there is this kind of attempt to go back you know, in a certain way to the founding of this war machine and this effort that's happening, right, in, in some ways. And, and not in the infantile way of, of, of video games or something like that, to think it through in a very different way. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Since I like movies, uh, you all know, and I think we all do, uh, Johnny, Johnny Toe films to me seem to be a very good example of nomadic thinking. At, at work, right? When you look at a film like, uh, um, uh, what's the the, the, the the mission, you know, um, you know, uh, is excellent. Very, very good, very good. Um, yeah, and Vengeance is also very good. Yeah, Jeremy, yeah, yeah. Triadic election. All of these things are very interesting the way that he's able to take on nomadic traces and powers, right, in, in some ways. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, going back to, I, I, I'm sorry to do this, but I think it's part of the same culture in, in terms of the French uh, scene. But, you know, Derrida talks about Heideggerian nostalgia, right, <laughs> in some ways, that Heidegger has this nostalgia for the Greeks, right? <laughs> and, and uh, you know, again, he has this nostalgia for the past, if you will. Whereas in the really true Nietzschean sense, there is no state thing. And the, the task is to leave no trace. So this is another thing of the nomadic thinking, you know, and Deleuze went through this. And again, I'm not so sure about this. And Jane and David can, you know, certainly attest to this. You know, madness is no fun, right? <laughs> in a way, <laughs> this, right? But at the same time, 
Uh, you know, Deleuze speaks about the jamming of all the codes by the Nietzschean moment, by the no nomadic thinking, right? In a way, you're jamming codes as you go, go forward, right? In a sense. And what happens if you jam all the codes? Are you producing a new cord, code? Or does this lead you to the Holderlinian, Nietzschean, you know, Ant Antonin Artaud type of madness? Or is it something that could be productive in terms of this attempt to jam the codes through the war machine? So anyway, that's just a little riff on, on the war machine. What's going on here, both linguistically and, and then in, in practice, can this really be liberatory for us today in some ways? Because all the other, the, 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 the old weapons just don't cut it. You know, I mean, I hate to say it. I mean, I, you know, I've been at this a long time. It just seems to me, you know, listen, Class consciousness is great, right? But you have to remember, and I don't know if any of you have read Tim Mason's work on Nazism and, and workers, uh, you know, very interesting work. What Hitler delivered was the workers wanted the immediate, you know, compensation. They wanted material benefits, right? This was delivered in the beginning. This is what happened. Why do people vote for Reagan, the working class? Why did they take up Trump in a certain way? And there's a very interesting, you know, attempt by Tim Mason to show why the working class was attracted, if you will, or would move towards this in the immediate sense. And again, you know, the ahistorical, the inability to have patience, you know, sublimation may be a term we could use, it's got the inability to really sublimate. I mean, I remember John Roshman when we did, uh, you know, a, a course on Lacan, that was the central concept sublimation of the four fundamental <laughs> concepts of psychoanalysis, you know, very central to what, what was going, going on at that time, you know. So, so in some ways, um, yeah, uh, I, I, again, I, I think it's important for us to, you know, study this through the, the qu question of, are we going to be able to invent new web weapons or at least be build new vocabularies that allow us to reach people and go a little little further in the, in this you know in in this endeavor if you will because again i mean we just can't back and say it was this way it's the same as it ever was or you know this is you know the way it's going to be and we we pick up on this little movement here listen i know it's very bright spots for chris smalls and amazon i know it's very bright spots in terms of Starbucks mobilization but at the same time, what weapons are really being created here in terms of this radicality from below? You know, how, how can this fight this, you know, monstrous, this, you know, what they call a Leviathan, by the way, you know, but, and, you know, and those of you interested in this, another imaginative account was Freddie Perlman. I don't know if you know Freddie Perlman, but it was part of the, you know, the, 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 the anarchist groups, his wife is still alive, uh, Lorraine. And uh, anyway, um, you know, he wrote a book called The New Leviathan about the United States back in the day. And, uh, you know, actually was a, a student of uh, Guy Debord, a very active student. He actually translated one of the early translators of the Society of the Spectacle. So anyway, all to say, you know, we're, we're fighting a Hobbesian, you know, universe in, in some ways in the most radical sense with all kinds of sophisticated things. You'll be astonished to learn that John Locke, one of the major thinkers of the US Constitution, going into our white man uh, framers, was a was a member of board member of the Royal Africa Company, <laughs> right? And it's tutelage, right? You'll be astonished to learn this. Or that John Stuart Mill was a member of the British, you know, uh, you know, East Indies Company, right? Was a was a clerk. So anyway, you begin to see philosophy, right? Conceptualization, how this is translated into academia, and and how it plays out. In you know really everyday life and in syllabuses and the way people are, are trained, where the utilitarianism is a doctrine, right, <laughs> that supports the the status quo. But you have to argue against this in a real way. You know, you can't just say I read Marcuse's Repressive Tolerance without understanding what Mill is up to when he writes. You know, the original document on tolerance, right? So. So again, I really think what we're fighting is this monstrosity. And, you know, we really need this, uh, 
new new vocabulary. I mean, I really look forward to this endeavor. I think David's right. It's a very exciting book. It has so many nuggets in it, you know, again. And I think you're going to enjoy reading, even though it's probably a, a, a little bit too much to digest in one session, the treatise on nomadology, the war machine itself, how he goes through this. But these are very subversive thinkers, you know, to put it mildly. You know, they are really, to me, they, they really show a different level of humanity to me, to me, a different level of humanness, right? <laughs> in, a, in a certain way, that the, the care, the depth of the thinking and what they really want and see in terms of, you know, quote, the new man, the Che Guevara's of the world or the, the building of the new, new subject. I mean, Guattari understood subjectivity as part of the dominant, uh, you know, model what's going on out here. Yeah, they understood this very well, subjectivity, you know. And I mean, I play chess. I don't know go that well, but I can see the difference in the games and how these are operations very differently, you know, in a way. And remember, Russians have produced nothing but grandmasters in chess, right? <laughs> but the go is a game of Asia, right? It's a, you know, quote, yeah, in a, in a way, yeah. So I think this is, again, very important. Uh, by the way, I don't know if anybody knows uh, this book, but if you if you ever read uh, from uh, Wittfogel's, Carl Wittfogel's Oriental Despotism, uh, uh, it's a book worth revisiting too, uh, 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 written, uh, you know, as a kind of Frankfurt School attempt to look at, uh, you know, uh, Asia and uh, somewhat the Asiatic mode of production and also, um, at the same time, all peace to Grover for the Soviet bureaucracy during the 50s as well. So a very, very interesting book that uh, Deleuze and Guattari. And then Gordon Child, I don't know if people have read this, but the again, the interesting thing, you know, Man Makes Himself uh, by Gordon Child, the Gordon Child. Um, but uh, we're, we're gonna see some interesting moments about metallurgy too, that, uh, the Deleuze and Guattari that is taken up in uh, in the uh, wars in capital too, you know, as part of a as part of another subversive moment of the war machine. So um, yeah, um, you know. Uh, so anyway, I mean, I, I hope this is uh, going to be uh, fun and uh, full of uh, you know uh, both uh, good humor and the creation of new new vocabularies for us and uh, you know. Um, um, You'll see all kinds of references here. Bear with me. I'll try my best to talk about McPherson, who some of you have probably read, the possessive individualism. They'll, they have a lot of citations here that are interesting that uh, go forward out of the Hobbesian universe. 1492, I would not date uh, capital for men, but anyway, I have a theory, you know, that uh, Trevisio arithmetic the switch from the abacus to multiplication tables that happened in 1484 in Italy was just as important as the discovery of the Americas. But anyway, we can work with those side by side. And, you know, there's a lot of debate about this. Yeah. But I'm glad to see the New York Times is now interested in Haiti, uh, Jeremy. You know, I guess you've seen that. I, you should write a letter, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. My mom sent that to me. I, I just wanted to. Oh, boy. I I'm in good company there. All right. <laughs> I don't know if people notice the, the, the headline of today's Financial Times is Investors Challenged by Demise of Three Decade Era of Globalization. Yes. yes. Geopolitical tension sparks decoupling fears. I mean, I'll give you a, a scenario. So at Goldman Sachs, they're sitting around right now as we have this session, late night, probably at some fancy restaurant in New York City, et cetera. And they're saying, how are we going to address this problem? You know, we need to say this was all a big mistake for 30, 40 years. We need to start investing in a different kind of economy. We need to buy the yuan. We need to buy some rubles. We need to get our people into those, you know, have them come to our business schools here in the state. You know, we still have Harvard, we still have Stanford, we have the Stern School of Business in New York City. We need to get these people together and have them, uh, have them, you know, educated in what this new world order will be, you know, in a certain way, yeah, in a sense. And, you know, we can live with a multipolar world as long as it's controlled by capital 
and, and flaws. We understand this very well. So we might as well put out the propaganda that the last 40 years is, is a big mistake. Anyway, that's what I would, I'm just putting myself in the role of Arthur Jensen from Network. Mr. Beal, there are no ideologies. They're just petrodollars. They're just currencies, Mr. Beal. The yuan, the ruble, the, you know, the shekel, the, you know, the, the yen, the, the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, you know, the US dollar, et cetera, et cetera, the pound and the euro. Yeah. So in some ways, this to me seems to be, you know, a more likely thing that's going on. Why the Financial Times would have a headline like that. I'm just playing on that. I don't know how you guys feel, but Michael Hudson would probably have things to say about this in terms of fictitious capital. And, you know, so would uh, Gladiev, uh, you know, the I Russian. Think he'd, I think he would agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, in fact, he, uh, he kind of thinks that uh, the war in Ukraine and, and the sanctions and all that uh, stuff that's come with it uh, have only hastened the process, you know, have really, uh, you know, sped up the, uh, the demise of, uh, um, of the current uh, neoliberal epic. No accident that the number one, I follow this stuff, Number one hedge fund performance, Chinese woman up 135% in the first first three, five months of, of, of 2022. Whereas pension funds in the US and other things like this have eroded 20 to 30%, depending on where you're invested, how much you're in cash, equity bonds, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm speaking at the level of uh, upper middle class, if you will, or, you know, bourgeoisie and you know etc but this is this is uh, sort of on the plate a lot, a lot of times right in, in so many ways so yeah yeah 135 percent she was up guess what she was in oil <laughs> energy stocks and pharmaceuticals <laughs> but, you know, this this was this was her, her thing yeah 41 years old yeah yeah Tra trained at Harvard Business School but lives in, in uh, Shanghai. Yeah. So anyway, it just goes to show you. So anyway, I, I don't know. I mean, again, wars and capital and what David was talking about, this whole thing about the state, you know, and capital and this, this movement that, that is happening. You know, but the, what, what is the war machine we have? What resources do we have, you know? not only to survive, because for me, it's much more than survival. It's actually living life at this point. How do we get over the fear of uh, COVID at this point? How do we get outside of all these things that have been, you know, basically in, in not, you know, that we've become so, so immunized against, right, in so many ways? How do we get back to really li living life again, you know, in a sense? Because we've been, we've been suppressed. In many ways, this is where Bernard Stiegler really speaks to me. We don't know how to make, therefore we don't know how to live. Therefore, we're you know basically proletaritized to the point of where we don't really know which way to turn. You know, uh, yeah, in so many ways. And and uh, you know, how do we begin to work our ways out out of this? I'm not saying you know, and of course this is this is a, a, a awful. Uh, disease, the pandemic, et cetera. But, you know, you see how seriously the, 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 and I won't use this phrase, the ruling class, just say capital speaking, what it really thinks of all of this, right? It has the audacity to have a prolonged war. This, this thing could have been ended the first week, right? Give, give Putin his victory in the East, right? <laughs> Let him have the Minsk Accords, et cetera. I think they would have said, beautiful. Yeah, we showed we got, you know, something back here We're and, you know, to have NATO sign this thing. But no, this is going to be prolonged because they want it to be prolonged. You know, they, they, they really think that, that, that they're, they're going to win. I mean, in this sense, but it fits much more into their global picture than it does to their, you know, to any humanitarian. And this is verbiage, human rights. This is so ridiculous to even speak this way these days. I mean, it's it's an insult to the human being to speak this way, you know, in this sense, right? I mean, you know, give me, you know, yeah, break, break. Yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, any, anybody else? I'm, I'm sorry to go on, but yeah, I mean, I hope you like Ernst Junger. It's
old school writing. <laughs> it's uh, very dense. He mentions many authors, who most of whom you're probably aware of. Uh, George, George Bernadas, uh, The Diary of a country, country, uh, a country Priest, a great film made by Robert Bresson, you know, of, uh, you know, the great uh, French filmmaker, uh, takes this up in a very active way. He mentions Bergson, I mean, excuse me, uh, he mentions um, uh, Bernadas as one of the authors who deals with nihilism on the spiritual level. And then of course, he, he goes through a whole list, Malraux, among others, he mentions Sartre's second uh, uh, version of the, of the Roads to Freedom called The Reprieve, the second volume. Uh, you know, is another interesting uh, thing. So uh, yeah, so Junger is probably our, our uh, you know, our, our, our parents, if you will, in some cases here, uh, you know, generation, right, in some ways, what's going on post-World War II, you know, and, uh, you know, what, what's really happening there, and how this thought is going, going through. And, it, and, you know, again, it presupposes a lot of, you know, the 19th century. Nietzsche thinks it's two centuries before we begin to see, you know, this overcoming of nihilism, or we begin to uh, see it for what it is and work with it going forward, you know, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, we're talking political economy mostly when we speak Mike Lutz and other people. But again, I'm more, I'm, I'm just as interested in one of the reasons I like this book is its philosophical dimensions. There's many, many levels in, in this uh, as well that are philosophical as well. So the, the last chapter, I think you'll find very interesting. He go, they go from strategy games from the Cold War, which seems to be coming back in terms of the propaganda, and we'll get a lot of depth there. Um, and, it, and, and its business to the recent stuff, the fractal wars of, 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 of capital. And another thing that's presupposed throughout this is that wars are not, well, quote, uh, you know, confrontation between nation states at this point. They're mostly civil wars now. This, this is the new form of war, that there's civil wars going on. And in the United States, we obviously have one going down. I mean, you know, you, you know, look at the incident in Buffalo, it just just happened here, you know, in a way. This is one of the great unhidden, you know, hidden and unresolved uh, contradictions is, you know, still working out the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments of the Constitution. You know, we still have that going down here, you know, and it's very scary that we're at this level. And it's very scary what's going on in women's rights. I mean, the, this is even more just as scary, right? Yeah. But of course, that's going to become, and I, I'm sure everybody knows this, and I'm not saying anything original here, but the Democratic Party could have legislated this into existence back in the 70s. But they have continually used it as a fundraiser, right? Continually. 50 years they have used the Roe versus Wade decision as a fundraiser. We have to protect your rights, right? <laughs> we need to get people on this, vote for us. Give us, write that check, please. They could have legislated this. They had majorities during the Carter administration after World versus Wade. They had it certainly during Clinton period. They had it during Obama's period. They never legislated this. They never put it into law, right? Besides that, as, as, instead of a constitutional amendment. Right. So this is one of the you know, reasons that they're, they act in really in what Sartre calls bad faith. Nothing mm -hmm. but self-deception and then deception to the public, too, of who they are together. Right. Yeah. OK, for this. So th for me, this is the start. There's another war, you know. Yeah. And, you know, we have a prosperity uh, Marxism. I think so. song is from Leonard Cohen. There's a war against the woman. Right. So we 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 we're working with this and they have a great chapter again. I'm really looking forward to reading this with you, of which Federici is filled, but also the war against women, which will fit very well with Kleist's Penthesilia, you know, against the state and the state apparatus. And it goes beyond just patriarchal uh, uh, things because they're looking Deleuze and Guattari are looking at this as force and space. They're looking at this through principles of physics as well as, you know, ideology. This is very interesting movement. They're really thinking about this in that, in that, uh, that, 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 that case. 
And Jünger will speak to this as well. You know, he'll speak about the spatio-geographical, right? In, in terms of some of his, uh, some of his uh, uh, moments too, right? And, um, um, and, and uh, another thing is, uh, you know, pessimism turns out to be very optimistic in Jünger you know, in some ways. So it's another irony that we should think about. The critical pessimism, in a sense, it may be one way. You know, uh, Ramshi is often credited, but it's Romain Roland who, who um, um, you know, coined the, 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 the sentence, you know, the optimism of the will and the pessimism of the intellect was run out of Roland, and then it's attributed to Gramsci, but he's repeating Romain Roland was a member of the French uh, Communist Party. But anyway, for Nietzsche, for for Junger, it really is a critical pessimism, you know, and and you know, and in a sense that really leads to an optimism, you know, in a sense, you know, and a kind of overcoming, if you will, across the line. You know, we're on this line, we're thinking through the line, you know, et cetera. This borderline, if you will, you can think of this in many, many different ways. You know, the border is a, a home of a thousand imaginations. The borderline personality type, type that cannot make the move to the next step, right, is caught in their own, you know, if you will, narcissism, etc. Uh, to that of you know the actual border itself and the real problems of immigration, migration, you know, movement, etc. How how fascism hates movement, right, of peoples, right? How, how much it despises movement of peoples, even though they come up with a war machine that is based on speed, right? The blitzkrieg, right, in, in a sense, right? Another kind of movement, right, in, in a sense. So I think all these things will we'll, we'll, we'll certainly confront and, uh, you know, engage. So anyway, any, any more thoughts? I won't keep you. Uh, so we'll read Junger next week. And, and if you can get to the Deleuze and Guattari, the Junger is not that long. It's, a, yeah, it's part of a book, which is the Heidegger-Junger correspondence. I, Josh just put up the, uh, the section we're reading because uh, the Heidegger-Junger correspondence is kind of boring. <laughs> I mean, or I would have had you read it. They don't really say much to each other except, dear Herr Heidegger, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, yes. And yes, uh, comrade Junger, I really enjoyed your stories of the war, right? <laughs> or you know what's you awesome? The co is it, am I wrong, Michael? Is it, is it Kojev and Junger, where they're like talking all this gnarly shit about Herman Melville? Uh, no, it's uh, Kojev and uh, Leo Strauss. Oh, okay. Yeah, that one is really... Another, the other, right, you know, the other right. You know, yeah, Kojev, right Kojev and Junger, to me, are the two most important figures who came out of war... I mean, thinkers who came out of World War, uh, you know, uh, 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 two, really, in a sense. Yeah, Kojev became the architect of the General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, yeah. right? He's the precursor to the EU. That the correspondence EU. is incredible, just like by like casual insight on literature and Melville and all oh, kinds of beautiful stuff. These are highly educated people, to put it mildly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Kojev, interestingly enough, went back to Plato and the Guardians, you know, and as most of you know, the war machine is certainly in Plato's Republic. You know, I mean, this is this is the war machine par excellence is the state, right? And this is an antagonist of Deleuze and Guattari, right? In many ways, you know, and they, they want to stay away from being state thinkers. You know, they consider Hegel the thinker of the state. Kojev was the thinker of the state, right? In so many ways. And as you know, Jeremy, I mean, the rumor is the, that there's a, a long correspondence between Stalin and Kojev or a book written by Kojev on his correspondence with Stalin. I know he wrote one letter, yeah, et cetera. He's an operative, as you know, in France during the, you know, the lectures, on, the, inter, the reading of Hegel for the six years were basically set up by the Soviet Union, you know, as code for the movement you know, um, in, in the, for the communist movement in, uh, in France from 33 to 39. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, Ma massive thinker. His book on Kant is really his book on Hegel. His book on Hegel is his book on Marx. This was one of the most clever thinkers in terms of codes, you know, that went, went, went on, you know, uh, during this period. He wrote a book on the philosophy of right. He wrote a book on the art of writing and the emperor, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, what, 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 um, 
uh, Justinian, and he had also a book, uh, you know, many other books on, uh, you know, philosophy of right of Hegel, the administrative book of Hegel, etc. So Koshev on one side, you had Junger on the other, right? And like I said, Brecht said, you leave Junger alone. He told the East German, he told Stasi, which had not been created yet, but he told the East German, you leave Ernst Junger alone. Yeah, don't don't take him, take him prisoner, right? So this is very interesting. So yeah, you have these two two kind of iconic figures, if you will, in different ways, who were you know not Bertolt Brecht or you know the Frankfurt School or other people we read actively that you know were very different politically after the war you know younger turning more and more towards the left but with a you know an aristocratic notion of the warrior you know etc you know and the and the worker warrior and an aristocratic notion and uh you know i used to joke with uh aronowitz you're kind of like younger's worker right and you know anyway he he, he was what <laughs> you know anyway you know and uh anyway um um but uh yeah and then what jeremy just mentioned the strauss um um Kozhev correspondence, it's called On Tyranny. They had an argument uh, about Xenophon's piece called On Tyranny, right? This is really but, good too. Which one is that, I'm sorry? It's called The Black Circle, Life of Alexander Kozhev by Jeff Love. Yes. It's yeah, not as yeah. good as if you had written it, but it's pretty good. That's all right. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, the, the, the best book on Kozhev is Dominique Alfre. It has not been translated, unfortunately. It's a great, great biography of it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I know of that book. I, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So another figure who is the antagonist of, of Deleuze and Guattari because he ends up philosophical anthropology. Please remember, these people are not humanists. None of them. None of the three authors we're reading <coughs> are humanists by any means. They have no touch to track with, you know, yeah, yeah, the the early Marx, if you will, or any kind of Kantian, you know, uh, philosophical anthropology. No, no truck at all with this. They're not. They're thinking way beyond that, and especially Deleuze and Guattari. They they make a point of eliminating this completely, and and Nietzsche is the first to attack. You know, philosophical anthropology because of his attack on consciousness as well as his attack on, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Kantian categorical imperative right? and morality. Yeah, and the moral right. So, this is a, again a, a very uh, interesting thing. Yeah, I recommend highly on tyranny. I mean, it's a real exercise in thinking through letters. You know, someone once said books are letters among friends, exchanged among friends. And that's a good way of putting it. The, the, these guys have enough in their correspondence to, I think, you know, issue uh, 25 dissertations at least, you know, in terms of their thinking. The way they talk about Plato, the way they talk about, you know, uh, Xenophon. And, and Strauss, again, no slouch. The Straussian is a different story, except for Stanley Rosen and, uh, and uh, what's his name at Harvard? Um, uh, Alan Bloom. Uh, Mans Mansfield, yeah, the, the Machiavellian guy who used to give two grades on the paper, the Harvard grade and then the Mansfield grade. And you can imagine which one was lower. Your Harvard grade is a B, it's a D from Mansfield, right? He used to put on the sheets supposedly two grades. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, so a, a C from Harvey Mansfield was something great, supposedly. But anyway, I'm not I'm not a big fan of the Straussian, the highly educated people, you know, in a way. And of course, people talk about this relationship to the Bush factor, the neocons and all of this. These are minor league Straussians. They weren't like Leo Strauss and, and this this great German uh, uh, group, right? Kozhev was Russian, by the way, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And started in political economy. And his brother-in-law was uh, Vasily Kandinsky. So, you know, again, no, no, no slouch there. So anyway, we'll, we'll be, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, engaging some of these people along the way, et cetera. So- I haven't uh, watched the Celtics game, but thank you guys for letting me- You watch the decide. Celtics game? Are you a Celtics fan or- Not particularly, but I want to see who's going to play in the playoff. Go play. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know, but I want to see who's going to play. <laughs> right, 